Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is Edmund of Langley and Infidelity in Royal Lines. Hello, and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the conclusion of John of Gaunt's story. This week, I'll be covering Edward III's longest lived and sometimes forgotten son, Edmund of Langley. Much like my earlier episodes on Joan of Burgundy and Blanche of France, plus Lionel of Antwerp, I'll be covering another topic. This is where I'll start discussing the Wars of the Roses and looking into some interesting information discovered when the burial site of Richard III, Edmund's great-great-grandson, was found. Unlike his two brothers, who also survived their father, John of Gaunt and Thomas of Woodstock, Edmund stayed out of politics and did much less militarily than any of his brothers other than Lionel, who in all fairness died young and ruled Ireland for years. As mentioned in Lionel's episode, the best place to get information about a subject who doesn't have their own biography, or for, is to check the biography of those they would have been closest to. Much like Lionel, I got information on Edmund from John of Gaunt's recent biographers. Helen Carr's book has a few useful statements, but Catherine Warner has a great deal of information about Edmund. I also got very lucky in finding a research paper on Edmund. A wrong whom conscience and kindred bid me write, a reassessment of Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, and the usurpation of Henry IV by Douglas Biggs from 1994 has a character assessment of Edmund that I'm looking forward to sharing. Also, hello Shakespeare. The full quote from Richard II, Act 2, Scene 2 is, Gentlemen, will you go muster men? If I know how or which way to order these affairs, thus disorderly thrust into my hands, never believe me, both are my kinsmen. Twan is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. T'other, again, is my kinsman, whom the king hath wrong, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Spoken, at least in the play, by the first Duke of York to his men. Edmund of Langley was born on the 5th of June, 1341, less than 15 months after his older brother, John of Gaunt. He was the fourth surviving son of Edward III and Philippa of Hainaut. He had two older sisters, Isabella and Joan, and you already know about his older brothers, Edward, Lionel, and John. His mother would have a daughter less than a year after he was born, though she would die soon after birth. She was likely not full term due to the practice of churching, making a couple wait 40 days after birth before recommencing sexual relations. If this daughter had been born in March of 1342, then she would have been premature. Edmund would have a further three surviving younger siblings, including his much younger brother, Thomas of Woodstock. During his lifetime, his name was written as Aismond de Langel. At this time, Anglo-Norman was still the language of the court, though English, French, at least what was spoken in the royal court in France, and Latin would have been taught in the royal household. Edmund was likely named for Edmund of Woodstock, Earl of Kent, Edward III's uncle, who had been executed early in his reign. The elder Edmund was the father of Joan of Kent, the Black Prince's future wife. The first years of Edmund's life wouldn't have been much different from his older brothers, whom he was closest in age to. They were all raised in Philippa of Hainaut's household. He would become a Knight of the Order of the Garter in 1361 at 20. Unlike the Black Prince, Lionel, and John, though, Edmund had to wait quite a while before being ennobled. The Black Prince had been made an Earl at three and was seven when he became the Duke of Cornwall. Lionel was the Earl of Ulster, though Jury Ux Oris, at nine and Duke of Clarence at 23. John of Gaunt became Earl of Richmond at the age of two and was made a duke at 21. Edmund had to wait until he was 21 just to become an earl. He wouldn't become a duke under his father's reign at all. It seems Edward III didn't know what to do with a fourth son. Just wait until next week when you hear what happened with Thomas of Woodstock. Poor Thomas. 
Much like his older brothers, Lionel and John, Edward III and Philippa were hoping that Edmund would make a profitable marriage match. To this end, in 1361, when Edmund was 21, they had John of Gaunt attempt to arrange a marriage for Edmund with Margaret of Flanders. You may recognize her name. She was suggested as a bride for John of Gaunt years later, after the death of his first wife, Blanche of Lancaster. Margaret was 11 years old at the time, and her father had been an ally of Edward III's. She had actually been married previously from 1355 to 1361 to, interestingly enough, Philip of Revaux, the grandson of Joan III of Burgundy from the last series. Edward III hoped this marriage would help continue Anglo-Flemish partnership. There was just one problem. The potential couple would need papal dispensation. They were both descended from Philip IV of France and his wife, Joan I of Navarre, and Edward I of England and his wife, Eleanor of Castile. At this time, the Pope was in Avignon and therefore slightly under French control, at least when it came to marriages that were alliances. John II of France was able to convince the Pope not to grant dispensation. Years later, Margaret would marry Philip the Bold, John II's youngest and favorite son. Edmund would just have to wait a bit longer to get married. I do like that they had John try to arrange this instead of Edward and Philippa doing it. Like all his siblings, Edmund would lose two sisters, Margaret in 1361 and Mary in 1362. He had lost his sister Joan, of course, in 1348 due to the plague. His brother Lionel and his mother Philippa of Hainaut would pass away within a year of each other in 1368 and 69. Edmund would serve in Brittany with his former brother-in-law, Margaret's widower, John Hastings, second Earl of Pembroke, in 1369, and then with Hastings again the following year in France. Also, in 1370, he would join his brother, the Black Prince, and John of Gaunt for the Siege of Limoges. The siege was successful, as you will all know by now, but I can't find much of Edmund's part in it. From reading through the Black Prince and John of Gaunt's biographies, I almost sense a man who did his duty, but didn't get much attention because he had three older brothers already doing the same, but with flair. <laughs> Plus, the Black Prince and Lionel of Antwerp were governing on their own in Gascony and Ireland, respectively. He was also described by chroniclers of his time as lacking ambition that his brothers obviously had. Though, as you'll see in a moment, a lack of funds might have something to do with this. Edmund would finally marry on the 11th of July, 1372, at the age of 31, to Isabella of Castile. She was, of course, the sister of John of Gaunt's second wife, Constance. Unlike John of Gaunt, though, this marriage brought Edmund little. He hadn't married a wealthy heiress. He had married the younger child of a dispossessed and murdered king. The couple even relinquished their claims to Castile. Due to the lack of a wealthy wife, Edward III granted Edmund a bit more than £650 per year to support himself, and his nephew Richard II would later add £500 to this. Remember, John of Gaunt was making over £12,000 a year. Catherine Warner, John of Gaunt's recent biographer, makes the argument that Constance and Edmund may have been better suited for each other, and Isabella and Gaunt may have been better suited. This, however, couldn't happen because Gaunt's aim in marrying was to give himself a claim to Castile. Marrying Isabella wouldn't have done this, so he married Constance. Personal happiness had nothing to do with who one chose to marry. It was just lucky if a couple fell in love after, as Blanche and Gaunt had, or Edward III and Philippa. Sadly for Isabella and Edmund, this wasn't to be. The couple would have three children. Edward of Norwich, born in 1373. Constance of York, born in 1374. And Richard Conisberg born in 1385. Now, this is where I need to talk about rumors. Rumors that may be unfair, but should be discussed. Isabella of Castile was a vivacious and beautiful woman, and possibly did something very shocking for her time. 
Let me remind you quickly that most chroniclers were monks, so they were completely obsessed with the intimate and sinful lives of those around them who aren't monks. You may have noticed the large age gap between Edmund and Isabella's second and third child. There were rumors of Isabella's loose morals and suggestions that her third child was not Edmund's son. The man said to be his father was John Holland. You may recognize that name from John of Gaunt's episode. He will, in 1386, marry Elizabeth of Lancaster, John of Gaunt's second daughter. This suggestion will come up again in this episode when I discuss the discovery of Richard III's grave. Do I think Isabella cheated on her husband with Holland? I, I don't know. I think it's important not to cu- accuse women of infidelity unless there's solid proof. The Tour de Nell affair, Elizabeth of France's affair with Roger Mortimer. But even with both of those affairs, remember, Isabella of France and Roger Mortimer can't be proved to be together until after the death of her husband. And with the Tour de Nell, there are historians who question whether the women were guilty. Edmund claimed his third child, and there is no indication that he treated his son differently, except that he didn't provide financially for him in his will. But it may be that he didn't have the funding. Isabella would die in 1392, and Edmund would marry for the second time in 1393 to Joan Holland, a granddaughter of Joan of Kent, his former sister-in-law. Yes, I did just say that sentence out loud. The bride was likely 13, Edmund was 52, and the couple never had any children. Just for fun, this would be the niece of John Holland, the man his first wife is accused of cheating on him with. She was also the half-niece of Richard II. I do sometimes feel that family reunions at this time were matchmaking events. Slightly creepy. Edmund would be appointed Constable of Dover and Warden of the Sink Ports in 1376. These are both ceremonial roles today. For example, the warden from 1965 to 1978 was Robert Menzies. My Australian listeners will know him as the 12th Prime Minister of Australia, serving in that role from 1939 to 41 and 1949 to 66. His predecessor in the role as warden was Winston Churchill, and his successor was Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, the Queen Mother. At the time, though, they had official roles. But compare this to his brothers being appointed Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, or Duke of Gascony, or Lord High Steward. It just isn't comparable. I'm sure a few of you, including Philip, will say I picked on Edmund a bit too much in his older brother's episodes. From this episode thus far, you've probably heard the story of a middling son with high-achieving brothers and eventually nephews. But think for just a second. This isn't the type of family where middling will do. This is a family where Lionel would have been seen as having done okay because he passed something, married well twice, and fought in Ireland without his brothers, even if he lost. Edmund had done almost nothing militarily without his brothers, or brothers-in-laws. And what he's done has been of so little note that no one would write about it. Part of that is his lack of funds but part of it really does appear to be his own drive, or lack thereof. I hope you'll get an idea of what I mean as this episode continues. Edmund would attend the good parliament with John of Gaunt, and he tried to encourage Gaunt to be amiable. In 1376, they would lose their brother, the Black Prince, and then in 1377, they would lose their father. Edmund wouldn't be as active in his nephew, Richard II's reign, as his brothers, Gaunt and Thomas of Woodstock. He went on his first solo military adventure, or at least without a family member. Don't don't worry, he he did take troops. (laughs) In 1381, as part of the Third Ferdinandine War. And after this message, you'll hear more. While his soldiers were able to reach Portugal with the help of King Ferdinand of Portugal's navy blocking the Castilian fleet, he was unable to impact the war in any way which may have hurt John of Gaunt's chances at ever being crowned King of Castile. It also led to the marriage of Blanche of Portugal, the only legitimate child of Ferdinand of Portugal, to John I of Castile, and Castile attempting to claim Portugal. This was poorly received by the Portuguese nobility, 
who did not want to be Castilian, and would eventually lead to John I of Portugal, Ferdinand's illegitimate half-brother, taking the throne in 1385. You can learn a bit more about him in John of Gaunt's episode, and in my collaboration episodes with Cork Out History. I'll include links in the episode notes. So, the one time Edmund tries to do something militarily on his own, and he ends up setting up the events that will lead to near civil war in Portugal, and ongoing war between Portugal and Castile. I guess it also means he inadvertently helped two of his nieces, Philippa of Lancaster and Catherine of Lancaster, find husbands. Right? Back in England, Richard II did reward him for his general loyalty and elevated him to Duke of York in 1385. It appears that Richard and his uncle Edmund got along well, but that Richard wasn't as grateful to Edmund as Henry IV would later be. Edmund was not involved in the Lord's Appellants in any important way. After parts of both Henry Bolingbroke, the future Henry IV, and Thomas de Mowbray's estates were declared forfeit, Richard would endow some of these on Edmund, though in a piecemeal order that made it hard to govern. When John of Gaunt died in 1399, some of his estates were given to Edmund by Richard as well. As you may be able to see, Edmund might have had reason to want to keep Richard as king. So what happened in 1399 is interesting from this perspective. Edmund would act as keeper of the realm while Richard was in Ireland in 1394 and 95, as well as in 1399. I hope you all remember what happened in 1399. Originally, Edmund sided with Richard, raising an army to defend him, but then picked the right side and joined Henry Bolingbroke. Prior to his overthrow, Richard II had implied that Edmund, and not his various cousins, was his successor. But we all know Richard played around with the truth. His goal wasn't to have Edmund be the king. It appears that he wanted Edward of Norwich, Edmund's oldest son, to be his heir. Edward of Norwich was only 26 at the time, and well-liked by many magnates. Dr. Biggs does present a reassessment of Edmund in his paper, arguing that he would be pivotal in supporting Henry IV's regime. I don't think this idea is wrong, but it does bother me that he did so little prior to Henry Bolingbroke's invasion. In his paper, Dr. Biggs points out that Edmund seems to be aware of how dangerous it could have been to stand against Richard II. He declined to support a Thomas of Woodstock regency in 1387-88. He also points out that while there's no evidence that Edmund was in collusion with Henry Bolingbroke, he appears to have been unsurprised by his nephew's decision to invade England. I think most of us were. It is possible the horrific end his youngest brother met in 1397 motivated him to stand with the best chance of removing Richard, seeing as that he was becoming more tyrannical. By standing with Henry over Richard, Edmund pretty much handed Bolingbroke the keys to the castle, and literally the great seal. He gave him men to stand against Richard and the actual apparatus to rule. In 1877, Edmund's tomb was opened as part of a remodel of the parish church where he was buried. Those Victorians loved digging up and looking at bodies. Upon examination, it was found that five of the vertebra of his lumbar were fused. Two of his cervical vertebra were also fused. In my life before having children, I was a massage therapist. I've treated clients in the earlier stages of what was likely severe arthritis, and moving, even in earlier stages, is quite difficult. Even with physiotherapy and medication, it is a painful condition. In 1399, Edmund was 58, in pain, and hadn't done much impressive for most of his life. But this one time that the kingdom needed him to act, on his own soil, he stood up and did something. Would it have been better if he had acted earlier? Yes, <laughs> but it does appear that even man of action, John of Gaunt, wasn't willing to step up against his king as long as his son's life wasn't at risk. It's been interesting switching from the three older sons to now the first of the two younger sons. Not just the changes in fortune because they weren't the oldest, but seeing fully the change in leadership from Richard II to Henry IV 
at least in Edmund's case. I do wonder if Edmund didn't act earlier against Richard II, because he knew the only person who could stop Richard was the one person who wouldn't, John of Gaunt. Unlike Gaunt, it appears Edmund never swore an oath to the Black Prince, an oath Gaunt took seriously. Had Edmund wanted to do more, but couldn't stand against his older brother, who wouldn't stand against their nephew, possibly it would make his decisions in 1399 make more sense. Oddly, Edmund's decisions helped me understand John of Gaunt's better. Edmund didn't have the same loyalty to the Black Prince, but he did to John of Gaunt. So protecting Henry Bolingbroke over Richard II makes sense. Edmund may also not have wanted to lose any further family members to Richard's tyranny, as you'll find out a bit more in next week's episode. After the overthrow of Richard II, it's often stated that Edmund retired from public life, but Dr. Biggs cites him witnessing 81 of the 84 charters issued during his lifetime in Henry IV's reign. It appears that he may have worked to help Henry maintain his throne in the early years of the Lancastrian regime. He would die on the 1st of August, 1402, at the age of 61. This made him the longest lived of all of Edward III's children. His youngest son, Richard, would be executed in August of 1415 for treason by Henry V. His oldest son, Edward, would die childless in October of 1415 at the Battle of Agincourt. Richard's son, also Richard, would succeed to the Dukedom of York with the death of his uncle. Oddly, his father hadn't been attained, so the younger Richard was also able to succeed to his father's title. This Richard, the third Duke of York, is the Duke of York we think of. (laughs) He will be getting his own episode after I cover Thomas of Woodstock and the other lists of claimants who were passed over for Henry IV. Richard and his son's claims to the throne came not through Edmund, but through his mother. Anne de Mortimer, the daughter of Roger Mortimer, who was Lionel of Antwerp's grandson. I'm not going to answer the usual question for either Edmund nor in next week's episode with Thomas. Neither really had any chance to be king. In Edmund's case, there was only the suggestion that Richard II was declaring him his heir. In addition, he never really had the drive to try to become king. I don't want to really analyze this because it's almost unfair. Not only did Edmund have no chance of being king, but he had to make the tough decisions of who would be king. Just a bit of a proto-Warwick the kingmaker. Do I think he's as redeemable as Dr. Biggs thinks he is? No, but I don't think he's the caricature history has made him out to be. I think he had plenty of earlier opportunities to show himself a great man, but he didn't take them until it looked like tyranny would win if he didn't step in. Now on to the second part of this episode, discussing the discovery of the body of Edmund's great-grandson, Richard III, in 2012. The following research was written up in Nature Communications in October 2014, and I strongly suggest reading it. It's fascinating. I'll try to include links in the show notes. What's most interesting about this discovery, other than the actual discovery itself, as in finding Richard III's body, is the findings related to genetically identifying the body. Richard III's DNA was analyzed and compared to two known female line descendants of his sister and five male line descendants of John of Gaunt. Yes, I know what you're saying. There are no male line descendants of John of Gaunt. And you'd be correct if genetics cared about legitimacy. John of Gaunt's great-grandson, Henry Beaufort, had an illegitimate son, Charles of Somerset. Through this son, the Dukes of Beaufort were created. This was thought to be the last known surviving male line from Henry II. Female line descendants are more difficult to trace because of name changes and due to the lack of the likelihood of them ruling or even remaining in the nobility. But the researchers were able to find two. Why is it important to find exclusively male line and female line descendants? Because at these types of genetic distances between 19 and 22 generations, mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome matches are what can be used to test relatedness. So a woman who is descended from Richard III's sister would carry the same mitochondrial DNA with minor mutations, 
since it's only passed on mother to daughter. Until the introduction of in vitro fertilization, there was no risk of a woman not being the mother of her daughter. Trust me, if kings really wanted to make sure their relatives ruled, they should have picked their sister's sons as their heirs. I'm sure someone listening has heard of chimerism, which is when two zygotes combine in utero so that one person has two sets of nuclear DNA, and how some children don't have the same DNA as their mother. Even if this occurred, it wouldn't make a difference with what these scientists were testing for. Mitochondrial DNA of siblings is the same. Scientists theorize that mitochondria was actually a bacteria that permanently fused with the cells that would one day evolve into our species billions of years ago. Sorry, I love genetic and medical science, so I could talk about this for hours. Why chromosomes are the same in the way they are passed on only from father to son. What happened when the various DNA families were compared? The mitochondria DNA matched with the expected mutations, but the Y chromosomes didn't, indicating what geneticists call a false paternity event. Remember when I mentioned the implications of Isabella of Castile having an affair with John Holland? Well, when this news came out, reporters jumped on it, implying that her supposed affair was the false paternity event. But do remember, it could have occurred at any point from Edward III and his sons, in this case specifically John of Gaunt and Edmund of Langley, through to the current Duke of Beaufort's family line, and at any point until Richard III's birth in his line. It gets more interesting. After this paper was released, the researchers were contacted by a man who was a male line descendant of Geoffrey of Anjou, the father of Henry II. The team ran this man's DNA to check, and it turns out it didn't match either line, which means at least two of the lines, or possibly all three, had a false paternity event at some point in their history. False paternity events are estimated in 1-2% to of live births. Now, some people will quote 30%, but that is for people who have sent off a paternity test to a lab, which would imply that false paternity is suspected. The team estimates that there was a 16% risk of false paternity event based on the number of generations and the 1-2% to expected number of false paternity events for the first two tests. How does this impact any of us today? It doesn't. Charles III's claim to the throne of England and the United Kingdom comes through many years of historical precedent starting with Henry VII's win at the Battle of Bosworth and continuing through the crowning of James VI of Scotland as James I of England and his personal union of the crown. The English Civil War, the Restoration, the Glorious Revolution, the Act of Union, the rise of the Hanoverian dynasty over the Stuart pretenders, and even the Perth Agreement of 2011. While I'm all for phasing out of the monarchy, I don't base my reason on genetics, because at this point, that would be silly. Till the last few decades, there was no way for a man to prove or disprove he was the father of a child, so there was no way for a king to. He had to trust his wife, and trust that his children were his. John of Gaunt, for example, clearly trusted Catherine Swinford. He married her and legitimated their four children because of that trust. If kings don't trust their wives, we get men like Henry VIII, and no queens want that. I think this discovery should remind us that each person is more than their DNA. They are their experiences, their upbringing, their friends, and family. If Richard III wasn't the biological son of his father, or his father wasn't the biological son of his father, it makes no difference, because what they fought for wasn't their DNA. It was the ideals that their parents instilled in them. And I think that's what we should remember. Does being illegitimate invalidate a claim? Theoretically, legally, yes. But we need to remember, these are rules we made up, not the laws of physics. No one is going around testing the current nobility to prove their letters patent are valid. No one's even suggesting it. Heirs of his body male and such. Next week, Thomas of Woodstock, before getting through the minor claimants and an episode on chivalry. Please get your questions in to me, and I'll see you next week.
Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.